Hi there, and welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and when I was 14 years old, I started making stop motion animations in my bedroom using my grandpa's old camera. Ever since, I've been obsessed with everything to do with animation, and right now I'm a student at Sheridan College. I created this podcast to connect with and learn from some of the biggest names in the industry, their best practices, the hardships they went through, and what to focus on to make it in today's changing animation world. It's my hope that by sharing this info that you too have the best chance of success. Now let's get started. Today, we're talking about how to make it as a freelance and a professional illustrator with the super, super talented Lawrence Hugh Burns. Lawrence is a graduate from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, where he received his BFA in illustration in 2009. Since graduation, he has pursued a number of projects, both professional and personal, including book cover design, card game illustrations, and graphic novels. And he currently works as a full-time illustrator and designer for the backpack and apparel brand Sprayground in New York City. I became familiar with Lawrence's work when I stumbled across his Instagram during Inktober a few years ago, and I instantly fell in love with the amazingly grotesque renditions he does of SpongeBob and Rick and Morty and Rugrats and all these other cartoon characters. So thank you so much for joining me today, Lawrence. Now, I always start things off by asking, what influenced you as a kid to get into this industry? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Terry. It's uh, good to be here. Um, and this, this question always give me, gives me pause just cause, uh, I n- never really stopped to think and realize where my inspiration came from, but growing up, I was fascinated when I'm talking really young here, picture books were, you know, an escape to a completely new world, uh, uh you know, impossible worlds that didn't obviously didn't exist in my in my youth and uh, I just absorbed those you know addictively you know it was it was just the illustrations in these picture books were so just just alluring um so I really young I would always just pour through through different picture books um but beyond that uh in grade school growing up I specifically recall moments where my teachers would read us uh, you know, chapters in The Hobbit or uh, chapters from the Redwall series and have the class draw, you know, what they were describing. And um, that was always a lot of fun because I got to interpret these characters that at the time I didn't realize were really established in the literature world or anything. And I got to interpret them with my own, like the way I thought. So it was a really fun exercise for my imagination. And, um, you know, Couple that with the Sunday strips, um, specifically Calvin and Hobbes, which I absolutely loved as a kid. Absolutely was their expressions, the line work, the storytelling. Uh, it just it just captivated me. I don't know what it was about it, but it's just everything was just so perfect. It was yeah, I could just tell that uh, Bill Watterson knew what he was doing and. He did it so deftly, just like a, you know, pen and ink, and it was so striking in that regard. Um, I actually, when I was young, I would trace over Calvin and Hobbes panels, but I would draw my own characters. And I I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a a pretty interesting exercise to learn how to do these gestures and everything. But I would just use my own characters, but in their poses and everything like that. And I, I feel like that helped me get a sense of uh, like the character's spacing and weight and everything like that. But uh, on top of that, uh, of course, there was the golden age of Nickelodeon, which is I was fortunate enough to grow up with. Um, Specifically speaking, Ren and Stimpy. uh, I don't know why I latched onto that one, but I did. I, I really think it was because whenever it was on TV, my dad would watch it with me and he would just be belly laughing the whole time. And I didn't really understand why. I just thought, you know, it was fart jokes and just weird, grotesque humor. But I, I thought it was really funny and, and strange. And watching it now, I'm so surprised that my parents let me watch it back then um, because it's so vulgar. And to, for her to be on Nickelodeon at that time, I guess they just, you know, didn't realize. But, um, yeah, it just stuck with me. And, and I, I it's just like a part of my my brain now so i think the combination of all that kind of turned into where i am today 
which is really cool because I've always, I've always, you know, loved Nickelodeon. Even now, I think they do great content. You know, SpongeBob is such a, a force, and I distinctly recall it was like 20 years ago when it first came out, or it will be 20 years. Actually, you know, it'll be 20 years this year. So, uh, yeah, all that stewed together in my brain, you know, produced me. So here I am <laughs> doing what I do. I can definitely see a lot of uh, Ren and Stimpy influences in your your artwork. Um, yeah. So I wanted to talk about kind of both the career paths that you've that you've kind of taken. One is like the freelance side and one is the professional side. I'm thinking maybe we can start with the professional side. So um, how did you end up, you know, going from graduating in 2009 to becoming an illustrator at uh, a studio? And like, how much did you have to hustle to get there? And, and kind of can you explain that path? Yeah, the path was not easy. <clears throat> First of all, I graduated in 2009, which, if correct me if I'm wrong, was the worst economic recession in, you know, living history, uh, worse or just as bad as the Great Depression. So I went to art school, graduated in a, an economy where there were literally zero jobs for, you know, people like us and people that did have those jobs held onto them ferociously. Um, so while I was at school, I would do landscaping during the holidays just to have a buck. And, um, you know, when I graduated, I stayed in Philadelphia, tried to make it work where I was doing my own, my own thing, getting freelance here and there. And, you know, I was bussing tables just to have, you know, some money in my pocket and that didn't really work so well. Uh, Philly, as great a city as it is, it's not a very good um, city to be working in creatively, uh, not, not compared to NYC or LA that is. Um, but <clears throat> I moved back to New York and took that landscaping job again and I stuck with it. It was fine for what it was, you know, it gave me money in my pocket. I was able to move out of my house with it, you know, cause I, I moved up to business development and then sales for this company. But all the while I was doing that, I would give myself projects just to keep my, my creative juices, you know, loose and my, my muscles, my, my drawing muscles and everything just, you know, in shape, like, you know, the, the graphic novel I was working on, you know, it wasn't for any publisher. It was just something for me. It was a creative outlet just so I could test myself and keep myself fresh and everything. Um, but that's the landscaping side. I was there a very long time and I was, just saying, you know, I can't, I can't make a career out of this. I don't want to. It's not what I went to school for. Um, but all the while I was there, I was applying for design jobs here and there. And as the economy got better, you know, job, more jobs were there. But it's a very competitive field. And full-time illustration work, it's out there, but it's very competitive. Um, so, you know, I would make profiles on CareerBuilder, Indeed, you know, LinkedIn, Monster. And I was just putting my resume out left and right. And, and no one was really biting the whole time I was doing this landscaping. Um, and then, you know, three years later when I was in the sales part of it, I got a phone call from this woman named Joni and, you know, she's just like, Larry, Larry. I'm like, no, this is Lawrence. And she's like, Larry, it's Joni. And like, I know her. And I'm just like, okay, what's up? And she's like, I have an opportunity for you. I found your profile on career builder. And I was like, wow, I haven't checked that in three years. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but uh, she, so, so yeah, I mean, uh, she told me about Sprayground and, you know, I, she got me a meeting with my current boss there at Sprayground. And then by the end of that week, I was, I had an offer. Um, so it was serendipitous. Honestly, it was very serendipitous how it happened. Um uh, but all the work that I was doing while I was doing my landscaping gig, I was, you know, feeding it into my Instagram and, you know, I was putting it out there for people to see and, you know, I was gaining a following and, you know, I was still growing creatively, which was nice. And that really became supplemental material when I went in for my meeting at Sprayground. You know, I had my portfolio, sure, but I pulled up my, my Instagram and, and Sprayground is a very, you know, street urban stylized you know they, they go for that really kind of cartoony sort of warped but approachable look like that's one of their aesthetics and you know my boss he he loved it 
And I think doing all that work and staying creative helped me in the long run to get where I am today. So, uh, you know, I, I, I understand as a creative, it's, it's difficult to find full-time work. And if you're working a job that you don't like, you know, you need to keep doing your creative thing on the side because A, it will help your sanity. At least it helps my sanity. And B, you know, it will help you get a job down the road. You yeah. Know? So it's it sounds like you kind of played a little bit of the numbers game at first where you were just putting yourself out there on as, as many platforms as possible and then uh, just doing your thing on the side and, and uh, constantly improving by giving yourself projects until something paid off, right? Yeah. I mean, the... The giving myself projects was just more a means to keep myself sane because, I don't know, me personally, if I go a couple of days without making any sort of mark on paper, you know, even if it's just some like crummy doodle, like I start feeling, you know, odd, like, or just like imbalanced, you know, like I just need that release sometimes. And, uh, you know, I, I knew in my heart of hearts that landscaping was not going to be my job for the rest of my life. But but being in New York City, it definitely opened up some avenues to me because I was I was doing the sales in New York City too. So I got to like see you know my friends who were working creatively and like you know I got to reconnect with you know old schoolmates and everything like that. That when they were able to help me out, so uh, I was in the right place, but I just wasn't doing the right job. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of that uh, putting pencil to paper thing. I hear that from a lot of our other artists too, where it's like even though you're working on creative stuff. You still have to do your own stuff on the side to stay sane. Um, and I, I want to get back to the uh, the social media aspect and stuff like that. But first, um, I want to know what it's like to be a full time illustrator at a, at a studio. Can you can you kind of go into that experience? Yeah, of course. Um, Sprayground is is a a unique um, kind of like it's not your average studio, you know, because we're we're in the fashion industry. And never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I'd be working in fashion of all places. I know illustrators that can get, you know, there's fashion illustration. There's, there's certainly room for illustrators to be in that industry. But with the work that I did, my style and everything, fashion, I thought, was the last place I would end up. Uh, lo and behold, though, I'm at, I'm at Sprayground. And Sprayground in and of itself is a very unique, wild, amazing company to work for. Um, the best part about it for me was that it introduced me to working with these IPs like Nickelodeon, you know, like the properties underneath Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network um, in a way that, you know, not it, it, that's not typical for, you know, fashion brands to be working with. Sprayground's claim to fame, at least with the licensed artwork, is that we take their characters and create complete original artwork, which, you know, years ago would have been unheard of for anyone in the fashion industry to do because a um, licensors are very, very strict about their, their intellectual property. Um, but, and, and Nickelodeon at first was very hesitant to, to allow us to do that. But once they saw how well these bags were selling, uh, they have given us free reign. And in a number of ways, Nickelodeon has been one of our first core, you know, believers in, in the brand. Um, and when I came on board, I saw the SpongeBob bags that they had done. And since I've been there, which is about three and a half years now, we've expanded. You know, we have Nickelodeon, we have Marvel, we've got Cartoon Network, to name a few. You know, and even, you know, the NFL and uh, Mega Man. Uh, we work with Sega and, you know, so we have Sonic the Hedgehog. It's just like our, our licensed stuff is far reaching and licensed work will always sell. That's not to say that we don't have our own original stuff, of course. Um, Sprayground as a brand, we have our own characters and we are, uh, without divulging too much because I'm not allowed to, are trying to, you know, expand on that IP where we have our own kind of world with our own kind of characters. Um, so can, can you describe so like you have like spongebob and sonic can you describe what exactly you're drawing for this for your apparel and backpacks like yeah of course, of course. Up drawing spongebob or you said it's a little different oh yeah it's not just it's not just spongebob slapped on a bag calling it a day so for example um last back to school season which is our biggest season that's when we make the most that's when we sell the most it's about 70 percent of our business i believe um we created a bag where we took the Sprayground staff 
uh, turn them into SpongeBob characters. So they were in the style of SpongeBob characters, you know, we were all fish or squids or anything. So it looked like we were in the world with them. And uh, the artwork was SpongeBob's house and then, you know, Squidward's and Patrick's house on either side. And, uh, you know, we're all just, it's just like chaos, you know, SpongeBob's house has got spray paint all over it. You know, there's characters from the show running around with us as characters from the show running around. And, you know, Nick Loden was like, this is a crazy idea, but we're into it. So a, a big part of our philosophy at Sprayground is that we like to tell stories. So each, each of our bags is kind of like telling a story. And uh, I think that's a really good example of that. Cool. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, you, you kind of honed your skills, uh, bef- your, your unique aesthetic maybe before you started working at Spraygown, but what kind of skills and like technical and soft skills keep you uh, kind of on your toes while you're at the studio and, and have contributed to your success? Um, well, I mean, I think consistency is key. Uh, I mean, I know consistency is key. It's just a matter of being disciplined to pull it off. Um, same with time management, which I am personally terrible at, but I know working illustrators who who survive off freelance alone, that they, just the fact that they are so good with their time management allows them to be as successful as they are. Um, but for me, since I'm at a studio all day creating, like I, I have little time when I come home to do my own thing, but I still put in the time to do it because a, I have deadlines aside from, you know, my studio work and B, you know, it's just, it's just good creatively because I'm all day. I'm, I'm working on someone else's project. When I come home, that's when I'm working my own stuff. Um, so time management I know is essential, obviously. Um, Let's see, uh, consistency as well, of course. Um, and also things like professionalism. You know, if you're reaching out to potential clients, you want to come off as, um, you know, professional and, and like, you know what you're doing, you know, you want, and this is all, this is all minor detail stuff. Like, you know, you don't want your, your email to be something ridiculous, like, you know, XX cool boy 420 XX at yahoo.com. You know, you want it to be your name. You know, you I wanna... mean, I kind of I want my email to be XX. Cool boy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, go for it. But I, I mean, this is this is just boiling down to my own personal uh, preferences. <laughs> but uh, if I got an email from XX cool boy 420 XX at yahoo.com, but his the body of his email was like you know put together and correct grammar and everything like that. I would I would be hesitant at first, but I would take it seriously. But if it's riddled with you know spelling errors or you know you're spelling you with the letter U and stuff like that, I'm just kind of I dismiss it and I'm just like I, I I think if you want to be taken seriously, you need to portray yourself seriously. Um, so you know simple little things like having your email just be your name. <laughs> I don't know, like maybe that's boring, but. Uh, or, or, you know, like LHB art or, you know, Terry stories or something like that um, for, you know, just an example. But, uh, you know, um, and if you're branding yourself as, you know, a standalone freelance person that can do do it all, I think uh, where consistency comes into play is having your, your visual voice across all social media platforms be consistent, you know, for, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, just, just making sure that when you're looking at all these things together and your portfolio too, your online portfolio, that they all live together well. I think as minor as these details might be, it really does go a long way. It shows that you care about how you're being perceived in the public and it shows that you're polished and everything. Um, how about um, technical skills in the actual illustration part? Because you mentioned, you know, time management and deadlines are always uh, apparent. So how does how do technical skills skills play into that i mean if you you know you finish the line work and now you're working on coloring it but you only have like a day left are there shortcuts you take that kind of work out or you're just always kind of uh planning everything ahead of time or is it just experience of knowing what's expected i think that comes down to knowing how you work as an individual um 
you know, this card game that I'm working on right now, uh, I was approached because I had a specific style that the client liked and I took the budget into account for each illustration and I'm using that information to dictate what the final art will look like, which for me, I know will still look polished enough, uh, in the end. Um, but yeah, like you, that's, that's tough to answer because everyone works differently. You know, um, I, I work digitally because it's quickly, I'm sorry. I work digitally because it's quick. Um, you know, people can work traditionally for freelance, but I would assume that they would just end up costing more because it just takes more time. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there that can create stuff traditionally in no time at all, but they probably charge, you know, a fortune for that because they, they know it's good. They can do it quickly. And yeah. Um, so, but, so maybe let's uh, take this freelance path a little further. You mentioned, you know, you're working on a card game right now, which I think is amazing. Um, and you also mentioned that they gave you a budget and you figured out what expectations they could have of your artwork. So, I mean, I know people who, and I've done this myself, where I'll get a, I'll get somebody reaching out to me on Instagram saying, hey, can you draw this for me? And I'm like, sure, I'll charge you like 50 bucks. And then it ends up taking me 10 hours. And then I just like, <laughs> I got way underpaid. It wasn't really worth it for me. Um, so how do you how do you go about figuring out the budget and and making sure that it's fair for you as the artist as well as the person asking for it? Maybe you have to just decline some projects or uh, give expectations a little bit more heavily or something like that. Maybe just talk to that a bit. Yeah, I think if you're approached with a project that you're not really feeling, uh, <laughs> and this might be I don't know if this is rude or not, but uh, something I learned in sales at least is like, say you're at a, you're, you're at a, uh, you know, there's a project that you get approached with. You're not really into it, but you don't want to say no. So you charge them an exorbitant amount. <laughs> and I don't know if that's taking advantage of them, but you're just kind of like, you know, they're going to say no, but if they say yes, then I mean, is it sleazy that you just like are going to make all this money, but now you're set up with this project you don't really want to work on, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Um, but, but more seriously, I think the big thing here is making sure that the client is respecting your time and that the pay you're getting reflects, reflects that. Um, this is something I'm still working at. Like I'm, I've, I've been terrible at this too. Math horrifies me and there are formulas you can use to charge per hour, which is what a lot of freelancers do. Um, I think with my specific work, uh, say someone reaches out for just like a commission, they want a character, you know, full color with, you know, full, like a full body shot, I would be like, yeah, a hundred dollars. And you know, that that's feasible. But in regards to bigger projects like this card game, uh, they approached me, they needed, they said that they needed, excuse me, 64 illustrations and uh, they told me what templates and what sizes they would be and everything like that. And with that information, I was like, you know, I think it's fair that I'm charging $100 per illustration because, you know, they want 64. That money adds up and, uh, you know, it comes out to a pretty legitimate price for the amount of work that I'm going to be doing. Because think about it, that's, that's 64 drawings and they need to buy a certain time. And, uh, you know, you're putting your life on hold and everything. So it needs to you need to be compensated fairly for that. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm getting $6,400 for 64 illustrations and there is potential there to, you know, cause they're going to be putting it up on Kickstarter where some stretch goals and everything like that, which they want to keep me for. Um, so I think where that comes from is, or like how, how to, how to gauge that correctly is, uh, I don't know. See, since I, I, I still feel like I'm, I'm so bad at it that I, <laughs> I, uh, well, well, maybe think back to like the first time you took on a project. I mean, uh, for myself, and I know I've talked to others, there's there's like a certain level of confidence lacking. Like, oh, how much do I charge? Like 15 bucks for like a full body or something like that? Like, how do you know how much you're worth from the beginning? I mean, for me to say 100 bucks for a drawing, 
like maybe I don't feel comfortable at that level yet because I don't know if my my art is worth that. Like how did thinking back to like maybe the first time you took a commission to now, how did you uh, kind of evaluate that and, and find your self worth in the in your artwork? I think when I started seeing the demand, I started to realize my worth. Um, you know, because I had I had done like a stupid drawing of Bart Simpson and I did like a time lapse video a couple of years ago. And that's kind of what jump started my my Instagram following. Um, and that's when, you know, I started getting more followers and my posts started getting more likes and I started getting more requests. And, you know, I would I was back then I was still like I was a little inundated. I didn't really know how to react to it. But, you know, I see the quality of my work now and I, I can tell that it's at a level where I am able to charge an amount that I am deeming reasonable for for what they're getting. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, how fast you can do it, how, you know, comfortable you are with the end product. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to evaluate yourself in these situations too, because, you know, you don't know if what you're doing is going to be worth it. But if you look at it on the other side, you know, you, you're paying someone say, say I'm paying you for an illustration you know, I'm paying you for the time that you're taking to create this image that will is essentially one of a kind. And, you know, I consider that valuable. Um, I think a lot of it is just kind of pulling the trigger. You know, if, you know, I think before we were recording, you told me that some of your, your, your friends or your coworkers, I'm sorry, your colleagues were uh, charging $10 for a work that they were doing five hours worth of work on. And that is just absurd. They, they should just be giving it away at that point. I mean, I hope I'm not putting them on the spot right now. But uh. <laughs> so, so like, wh- how do you find that confidence when you're when you're starting out fresh? Because um, y- you're right. I do see people undercharging because uh, maybe ten, fifteen dollars is valuable at that point for them. Versus, uh, you know, the fear of charging more um, and not getting any anything out of that so so how do you find that confidence for somebody who's just starting out i think it's a matter of just looking at what you deem finished artwork and seeing how complex it is and 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 calculating the time it took you to complete you know said artwork um and i guess this is where math would come in you know uh, me personally i just like to throw a number because if someone will, will request something from me and I can kind of figure out how long it's going to take in my head and I, I do rough math. I keep, you know, I do, I do like round numbers. I'm never like, you know, $458 and 72 cents. That's just ridiculous. You know, unless you want to be like that, but I like nice round, even numbers. And, and I think, um, you can put down on a piece of paper in a certain amount of time and, uh, you know, just, just knowing what to, to charge for that because, at the end of the day, it's your time and time is your most valuable asset. You can never get it back. You know, it's always running out and uh, you need to make sure that you're compensated fairly for, for something like that. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, random quick question. When you're yeah. charging, do you do like a half upfront thing or like payment at the end or? Yeah, I would always try to secure at least half upfront. Okay. Um, or, or at most, I mean, uh, in, in, in regards to the card game, they're paying me in installments because they just, they're not going to throw, you know, $3,200 at me immediately. We're doing it, you know, as, as a per 10, per 10 illustrations, they'll get, they're going to give me, you know, so we, when we started out, they gave me $500. And when I finished the first 10, they gave me the second half of that a thousand and then another 500 for the second batch. Um, I have a shirt illustration project that I'm currently working on where the client gave me half of my sum up front and that that locks in my time for him and totally you know to be totally honest and transparent it kind of lights a fire under my ass too because I'm like okay he already gave me money that means he needs this you know like I I, I can't forget about it. I can't just like let him do it you know a lot of times if someone says they'll pay you I prefer to secure it because you know they're not going to like run away on you or like ghost you or anything. So I always try to secure at least half of what I'm charging. I mean, I mean that makes sense to me, and I think that's a good practice. Um, 
So speaking a little bit more about how you get these these clients, uh, you mentioned you did a Bart Simpson time lapse video. I think yeah. I actually saw that one. Uh, <laughs> that goes way back, man, way way back. <laughs> well, I might have scrolled through your entire history at that point. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm assuming you get most of your inquiries through Instagram. Is that true? Or do people see your artwork from, uh, you know, the apparel that you're designing and also contact you there? I'm just, I'm asking because I'm wondering, are there specific things that you do that you know are going to get attraction to your freelancing? So when you're on Instagram uh, and you're like, you know what, I could pick up a few freelancing gigs this month. Do you already have that demand or do you post, I don't know, like another time-lapse video to try to get more people on your Instagram so that maybe you increase chances of getting somebody, I don't know, like maybe you can just go through best practices of how to attract the right kind of freelance customers. It's, it's interesting. Uh, cause for me, I wasn't necessarily looking forward to work for it when I, when I posted that video, um, it just like kind of like exploded and, and happened. And like, I saw that there was a reaction, so I kept on doing more videos, and I, I saw I was getting more followers, more likes, and, and eventually I got these DMs. Um, but if if the if my well is a little dry, you know, I'll just put out a call on Instagram and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm doing commissions, or uh, you know, I will be happy to, you know, or just yeah, I'm just doing commissions on Instagram. But commissions are are one thing. Uh, freelance work like this card game, for example, or like the t-shirt design, um, came from the relationships I had built in the past. You know, I always think it's a bad idea to burn bridges, no matter who it is, you know, um, because they, for whatever reason, they'll, they'll lead you to someone who is looking for design work. Um, you know, case in point, my, my client for this card game is actually the husband of one of my very good friends from school. And, uh, you know, I've known him a while, but he, he's finally able to fulfill this, this, this vision of his, and he wants me to be a part of it. And he was able to get like financial backing where he's able to pay me for it. So it's just stuff like that. Um, another example is my, my senior year professor at UArts. Uh, he ran a little boutique design studio outside Philadelphia. And, uh, he was, he was very keen to my work as a student and, uh, I interned for him after, after school, and, um, you know, when I, when I moved away from Philadelphia, uh, he contacted me when he had projects that he could, you know, was able to pay me for. Um, you know, I always, it's, it's just networking is, is so important, you know, in this regard, even if you're not looking for the work, like, you know, you're just making friends and they know you're a, a designer or an illustrator. And, uh, a lot of the times it, it comes to me like of course you can look for it. you can go to fiverr or whatever or put out a call on instagram but uh, a lot of times it just comes to me and maybe that's just a testament to my work not to to my own horn or anything but you know you put it out there people are going to see it and they're going to want work and i think it's important that you just keep feeding the social media beast with your you know your your artwork and eventually the right person is going to see it so you mentioned, you know, networking has been really important to your career. And, and that's something I hear a lot. And that's also something that I found important to my career path as it stands right now. Um, can you speak to uh, kind of what you do to to network or maintain relationships over a long time? Like, obviously, the card game came from your your friend's father. Is that right? Uh, my so, friend's husband. Your friend's husband. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so that was more of a really personal connection. But say you make a connection with your prof and that was years ago how do you how do you maintain that contact over time it could be as simple as every holiday or every christmas or hanukkah you know you send them a little hey you know professor merry christmas and here's a little doodle i did you know it's stuff like that that shows you're thinking about them um right. you know it's a really say, good idea actually to do yeah. like a yearly a yearly roundup of everybody you know. Yeah, you Christmas. know, just <laughs> add these people to your digital Rolodex and just send out an email blast, you know, just, you know, hey, Merry Christmas, you know, Happy New Year with like a little like spot illustration or something like that. It, it It's it's touching because, you know, it's it's personal and it, it just plants in their in their minds like, oh, like Lawrence just sent me this cute little 
doodle, you know, like maybe there's a job coming up that I have for him. You know, it's yeah. stuff like that. It's just a matter of being, you know, personal or personable, I, I should say. That down. I think that's uh, a great, a great piece of advice right there. Yeah. Because sometimes it's, uh, at least I find it awkward to like randomly reach out when you uh, haven't talked to somebody in such a long time. And like, what do you say? Or even if you have something to say, it's like, hi, h- how's it going? It's been like three years since we chatted. Hope everything's well. And they already know you're asking for something. Right? I know. I mean, that's that's where you can't let those. I mean, I know it's just natural. It happens like people just like move on and like move away. But if you left it open-ended the last time you spoke to them I don't think there's any harm in reaching out you know you obviously they might know that you're looking for something but like what's so bad about hearing from someone you haven't heard from in a very long time you know and what's the worst that's going to happen they're going to say hey you know like hope you're well I'm sorry I don't have any work for you right now you know and but at least it puts you back on their radar you know if it was like if it was like 10 years ago that might make it even stranger because they could they you know like i don't know they could have gone through so much stuff in their life and you're like oh you're just reaching out when you want something but i don't know know. um so kind of the final thing about uh, social media is i was wondering do you have any do you have any like practical tips on how to i mean you have almost thirteen thousand followers now do you have any practical tips on how to increase engagement like for myself i only have a thousand followers and many of the people i know are or just starting out with a couple hundred, like what would you do to take that thousand to the next to the next level? So this is tricky. <clears throat> you know, a few months ago I was at twelve point nine. You know, I checked this morning. I'm at twelve point seven. Oh no, it's decreased. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know exactly why. I know exactly why. It's because I have not been very active. And uh, Terry, as you know, like the past month for me has just been like chaotic. You know, with my I know. Your, your last posts are almost from Inktober. Like that's I know. That's, like so good. that's crazy to me. It's because, you know, Instagram forces you to just constantly, constantly post. Like that's the only way you're, as far as I understand, your posts get boosted and that there's more engagement or anything like that. There's a science to it, a science that I am, as I think I'm figuring it out, you know, they just go and change the freaking algorithm on me. So I just need to like, you know, start from scratch. But the moment you become stale or stagnant on Instagram, you know, your numbers are going to drop. And I'm just like, you know, what's your problem? Like, how do you even know I'm not posting anything? But maybe they, you know, they have to go out of the way to like unfollow me. And I think that's like a little weird, but uh, (laughs) yeah. Um, So, okay. So, so you're kind of saying you need to continually post. However, like that's, that's another sort of problem because for me, for instance, I only like to post like super polished work that I'm like super proud of. I don't post like work in progress or anything. And I also uh, was talking to one of my classmates who is trying to trying to like increase her bravery to, to post more because she's, you know, she's a little shy about her work too. So would you say, you know, go about posting like I'm posting where it's only the super polished stuff or everything in between just to keep the updates going? Like, what's your experience with that? Um, I think what's good to create like kind of like a buffer for posts is you can work on your polished stuff, but why not show your followers, you know, your sketch phase or, you know, just like a, like a, like a simple drawing in the meantime, just to like hold them over, you know, cause they're following you for a reason. They want to see your stuff. Um, you know, or show them the markers you're using, like your your process, you know, like your workstation. They're they're following you because it's you, you know, like I, I, I know they're following you for your art, but it's also it's a personal connect, uh, connection at the end of the day. Um, and they're they're hungry for content and content is what you have to give them. Um, I, too, am like you where I only like to post like really polished stuff and I only have so much time to do that. Um, and again, like I, I'll post some of my, my commission or freelance work and I maybe get like 200 likes on it, which is abysmal compared to some of the, the amount of likes I'll get on other posts. And I, I really believe that time of day has a lot to do with it as well. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, if your, your 
peer is shy about posting her work, she just needs to put it out there. You know, I think she just needs to dive off, you know, into the deep end and just let the world see what it is. You know, like the more you post, the the more people are going to come. I I feel like that's just what it is. Just keep feeding that beast. You know, that social media beast is voracious. It's hungry. It just wants your, your content and you just need to like keep it, keep it fed. And it gets angry if you don't feed it and then takes away your followers. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, (laughs) that makes sense. Um, So, yeah, I mean, we've covered quite the the range of topics. We talked about, uh, you know, how you made it as uh, a studio illustrator. We talked about social media. We talked about freelance uh, contract work and how to price things. Is there anything else that you think is important to share about how to make it as a successful illustrator in today's changing, you know, climate? climate of illustration i guess <laughs> uh i don't know like this is where you know i i feel like i i am a little too humble sometimes where i'm like oh what advice could i impart like what good is my word but uh i don't know i think it's just a matter of making sure that you're constantly challenging yourself as an illustrator you know to grow you know, even if it means drawing something that you're not particularly used to drawing or studying something that you want to get better at drawing, you know, be it like, you know, cars or industrial equipment, you know, uh, I'm stealing this from Jake Parker, but Jake Parker, I'm probably butchering it. He says that, you know, everyone has a creative, uh, you know, bank in their, in their head where they need to keep like creative capital in their mind, you know, constantly feeding themselves information so that when they want to draw something, they can tap into that, you know, account and have something to draw. So it's a matter of keeping yourself stimulated uh, mentally with, with new ideas and experiences and everything like that. Um, But yeah, I mean, constantly challenge yourself, never stop drawing, find time to, do your own work for for yourself because there's going to be a time when you're working professionally where it's not your vision and you might feel frustrated because of that because we all as creatives have our ideas that we want to you know nurture and see that see it grow and become something where we could get to a point where we have other people working on our ideas for us you know like that sounds great but uh I think it's just a matter of finding time for yourself. Can you do. can you think of a time where you were working on a project and became <sighs> um, not necessarily a project so much, but I think when it's like I uh, we were talking about this before. I, I think you started recording, but um, you know, the past couple of weeks, I just haven't had time for myself to to do any any artwork for myself just because like things have been crazy on my end with freelance and moving and wedding preparations and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, my most recent post on Instagram, that chef, I was like, I just need to do something where I'm challenging myself. So I tried creating this image in a completely like new style that I don't particularly work in. Um, you know, cause I do like the, the, the heavy line work graphic, pop culture stuff all the time. And that was another, that was another thing too, actually I wanted to touch on is careful with like pop culture stuff, because I know this seems out of left field, but you start doing it, people react. And I think that's something that I had done on Instagram where I was relying too much on other characters and, you know, Rick and Morty, this and Bob's burgers that, which I love. And I know people love it when I draw that stuff, but I wanted to do my own thing. So, so why do you, cause, cause, um, I know a lot of people who will, you know, draw in their style and take, uh, characters from, from cartoons and things and, and kind of do their own versions of that. And some people have been very successful doing it that way, but how do you, what do you mean pigeonholing yourself? How, like, how have you experienced, uh, uh, being pigeonholed, I guess, from, from, from doing, doing that? that? Um, yeah. well, yeah, case in point, you know, I'll, I'll spend, weeks you know posting on instagram just you know fan art for lack of a better term and uh, the moment i post something that's 
unique to myself, you know, the engagement is low or I start losing followers, you know, it's stuff like that. And I know at, at the end of the day, that's all really superficial. You obviously, you want people following you, but the right. people that are, you know, like you, you, you see that number going down and I hate to admit it, but that like that messes with your mind. You're like, Oh God, what have I done to betray my, my dear, dear followers? Because that's, that's you know, what I'm, I'm going, I'm going through your Instagram post right now. And there's actually like a clear difference in likes between, uh, when you post something like Ren and Stimpy, for instance, got a couple of thousand likes and the next day you posted your own thing. It only got like 500 likes. And then after that you posted, uh, like Rugrats and it got a couple of thousand likes. So I guess, I guess there is a market for people looking for fan art, uh, maybe through hashtags or it comes up in their feed or stuff, which is kind of interesting. Um, do you think there's a difference in the people who like your fan art stuff versus your personal art stuff? I mean, I don't want to generalize my, my followers like that. I'm sure I trust that the people following me are following me because they know I'm a, a good artist in general. <laughs> Um, but I definitely can tell that there are people following me because I draw, you know, Ren and Stimpy in such a gross, weird way, or I draw, you know, Dr. Zoidberg in a weird, gross way. Um, but the moment I draw my own characters, they're just like, I haven't, I don't know who these guys are. I don't care for it. Where's my Rick and Morty, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but look, I don't mean to bemoan people that that are, are drawing fan art if you want to do that that's great do that but you need to be careful because the moment you start wanting to post your own stuff after you've you've cultivated this following uh by posting all this fan art you're going to you're going to lose them because they're not there for your your original artwork they're there for your fan art and uh that's all fine and good but i would prefer a lot of times to do my own thing but i hesitate because i am afraid it's not going to get the engagement that i'm used to so it's it's tricky it's tricky and i wish i had realized that a little sooner but when you see your followers increasing you're you're kind of like oh boy this is it i hit i finally hit the you know the right vein so you're going to keep giving them what they want and then all of a sudden you find yourself just drawing rick and morty over and over again you're just kind of like exhausted because that's what i do at work anyway <laughs> and I mean, I'm generalizing, of course. Right. No, but that makes sense. I mean, uh, it, you're you're building up a market of people who are expecting a certain uh, caliber of work, expect certain work from you, are kind of not seeing that anymore. I guess so. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, like I don't know, like are you are you creating our work for your followers? Or are you creating it for you? Right. That's, I guess that's kind of the question you got to ask yourself. So what's the goal behind it, I guess, too? Um, well, I want to create art for myself so I can grow as an artist. Um, granted, I know you can, again, it's so ambiguous, too, because you, you can grow as an artist doing the fan art. I know I have. Uh, I would be, I've learned how, like, you know, I feel like I've gotten better at painting digitally while I was still doing this, quote, unquote, fan art stuff. But uh, I want to apply that to my own original stuff. Hence the the chef with the swordfish head. Makes sense. Yeah, and uh, I like that one. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's been a great chat so far. Um, unless there's anything else that you think is valuable to share, I mean, this has been this has been really great to chat. Thanks. Yeah, I hope that I was able to impart some some wisdom. I hope I didn't ramble on on and on and on too much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Lawrence. It's it's really been great to have you. Of course. Um, now, just before we leave, I want to share how you can follow Lawrence's work. Uh, I definitely recommend checking out his Instagram. We talked a, a whole bunch about that. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> lawrence.hugh.burns. You can also check out his gallery work, concept art, and storyboards on his website, which is lawrencehugh.com, and I'll share both those links in the description and okay that's all for now thanks for tuning in thank you terry all right okay bye <laughs>